recording. Fantastic. All right, so we're going to talk about pharmaceuticals and pharmacology today. So the meeting that we just had on this, positive note, they realized they might have went a little too far on the pharmacology questions. Huzzah. Um, they, they, there are some PTs that actually started throwing some fits about some of the questions you guys were getting asked, asked as PTAs. And then there were some PTs that took the PT boards that felt that the questions had nothing to do with what they were going to do as a PT anyway. Um, so they did a, a uh, and after the boards, I think from the July board and the October board of people that took the tests and asked them about the pharmacology questions and pretty much got massive negative feedback about the pharmacology questions. Um, right. Uh, now, does that mean you guys don't need to know more about farm? No, actually you guys do need to know more about farm, but you need more, more about multi-farm or poly-farm than you need to know about specific pharmacology. Hold on a sec. Dr. Reskin asked if you guys checked the website, I said, yeah, you should, they check the website. It says by appointment only, but you can't make an appointment. <laughs> so it doesn't help. Um, but so the boards themselves, what they've come up with is they're revamping. So the previous, all the new pharmacology questions have gone back to kind of be revetted. Um, good news I can tell you guys is if you see a pharmacology question, if it's not about stuff we're going to talk about today, you can pretty much with fairly high uh, sensitivity rule that question out as a uh, bonus question. That's not a bonus question, but a test test question. Um, you know, if it's starting to talk about the you know, efficacy or something like that of one specific drug, it's probably a test test question. Um, so it's got a very, very low sensitivity at this point. So I tried to, we're going to talk through a lot of this stuff today and kind of talk about what you guys specifically need to know for your boards, for pharmacology. Um, and it is more than I had to know when I went through. Basically, when I went through, I had to know the difference between an NSAID and an analgesic, and that was basically it. Um, they, they just didn't care. That was, that was all the pharmacology that I had to deal with. Um, but now you guys, there's a lot more patients on more meds, so you guys do have to know a little bit more. Um, so we're going to go through these again. We had these terms before. These terms are all fair game for your boards. So you do need to know, that's why I put them kind of at the beginning here. So everything I put at kind of the beginning is a little bit of review from our last farm lecture. But it's the reason I'm reviewing is it is all fair game. Um, so I do want to cover that. So obviously the pharmacology, anytime you have an ology, you're talking about study of, right? Biology, histology, anything like that, ology is the study of. So pharmacology is the study of drugs themselves, right? You can get a doctorate in pharmacology. You can also get a doctorate in pharmacokinetics, the way that the drugs are absorbed, distributed, metabolized, and excreted, right? How the body processes drugs. And you have to think about this because as difficult as it is for the human being, you have to think back to some of the, like, especially when you, when, you know, I'm always amazed when I talk to people that are in like the vet programs and that, because they don't have specific pharmacologists or, you know, anyone that specifically gives their meds out. You know, their vets are the vets, are the surgeons, are the pharmacologists, are everything when it comes to your pets. So they've got a lot higher, you know, ground clearance to get for knowing stuff. Um, so pharmacokinetics, again, the way it's processed in the body. The pharmacodynamics is the way that everything is processed, how it's going to, the biochemical effects on the body, right? So if you take an analgesic, how is that going to relieve your pain? right? A pharmaceutic is how the drug's broken down, right? So this is once it gets in, not necessarily how it's metabolized, but what happens to it? Where does it get split apart at the atomic level? What happens to it when it gets, meets up with stomach acid? What occurs there? That type of stuff. 
The pharmacotherapeutics is using drugs to treat disease, right? Therapeutics is any time that we use drugs to treat a disease. There are specific drugs that fall under PT, you know, standards that we could use to treat disease, right? We have acetic acid. Um, we have our steroid treatments for reducing inflammation and stuff like this. So there are certain things that do fall under our kind of our guise for treating patients. Uh, Pharmacon and economics, this right now has become a big, big thing here in the United States, right? Looking at how drugs relate to each other with price, you know, or, you know, even looking at, can you go to Rite Aid and then go to Walgreens and the prices are different? Why is that? Why is, why, if you get one generic drug and you go to Walgreens and then you go to, you know, Rite Aid and they're two different prices for the same drug, why? Why can they do that to us? What do you think? I'm still talking, right? Right, supply and demand is one of them. Yep, there's a good one. Markups. And just general money. There's not set, there's no one that regulates it. Right, no one regulates how much the pharmacies specifically charge for their drugs. Do they regulate the pharmacies on, you know, following prescriptions, everything like that? Absolutely. But there's not a specific agency, not even the FDA, that says, okay, you know what, Rite Aid, you're charging way too much for acetaminophen. You need to back that down a bit. That's kind of scary to me, that there's not some sort of oversight on how much people can charge for meds. That's how we end up with the problems where, you know, insulin's $400 a bottle, right? Because there's not somebody to help regulate those prices. In almost every other, I don't want to say civilized, every other modern country out there, there is a department that regulates pharmaceutical prices. Now, most of them have, you know, covered insurance for all the population, stuff like that, so it makes it a lot easier. And they have a vested interest in managing those prices. Right now, we have no vested interest because we have so many insurance companies, it's impossible to manage all those prices for every insurance company. It would be, it, it would be madness. There's no way you could do that. And, you know, speaking from experience, you know, with having my ex-wife being on my plan for insurance and also having her Medicare, you know, we sometimes had to play the game of, well, this medication that she gets is cheaper on Medicare but this medication is cheaper on my insurance. So we kind of had to play that game of bouncing it back and forth on where those pharmacies come out. Or some of them, you're just like, uh, I remember specifically one of them, prednisone. Prednisone made me laugh because on my, well, back when she was taking it, back before she passed away, she was taking six prednisone tablets a day. So she had to have about 180 for a 30 day supply. On my insurance, when I worked at the hospital in Pennsylvania, that 180 day supply, was $32. On Medicare, that, 30, that 180 pill supply was $22. If we paid cash, it was $8. Those are those things that you go, what? This makes no sense whatsoever. So if I use my insurance, it's more expensive. How, how does that make any sense at all? It doesn't. Um, pharmaco, pharmaco, yeah. Pharmacogenomics is how those drugs affect your genes. And, you know, I, I understand and think about this. The longer you're on a drug, is that going to slowly affect your genetics? What do you think? Yeah, right? Especially ones that have toxology problems, you know, like lithium. So like that's gonna slowly affect your genes. That means not only that, but that means you could possibly pass these now modified genes on to your offspring, right? So it's kind of teratogen, especially exactly, right? So, but think about it. Say that I've got a say that I've got a bipolar disorder, and they have me on bipolar meds. So my body loses the ability to self-regulate my emotions at that point because now I'm dependent on my meds to regulate my emotions. But when I have a kid, 
you know, there's a possibility or you know, there's a likelihood that I can pass on that dysregulation to my child. So now I've got bipolar, you know, and now maybe the child comes out and has bipolar when they get to their teenage years. How can I say that they have bipolar because of my genetics and not because of my modified genetics from taking a drug? I can't. So it's a really kind of you know chicken and egg thing here. Of the, the, are the drugs causing some of our genetic offspring to have these weird conditions, right? Lupus is a great example of it, right? Lupus and all the autoimmune disorders. You know, they say, well, autoimmune disorders are on the rise. Well, yeah, they are, but we're also diagnosing them better now. But could we be seeing a rise because we've had a whole population that has been treated for so long with autoimmune disorders that they're now passing a new form of autoimmune disorders onto their offspring? It's kind of an interesting thought process, right? That's, that's a really one of those, huh, you know, it, it, this could be one of those where the cure is worse than the disease, where we're passing on something worse than what we had to our you know, children. It's kind of scary when you think about it. Uh, again, this is probably my favorite one here. So I love psychopharmacology. To me, this is the by far the most interesting thing in psycho or in pharmacology there is. How do those drugs affect your mental state? Right? Not only the drugs that are made to affect your mental state, right? Not like the Haldols and stuff like that, but also how do drugs like, you know, something similar like an antibiotic, how does that affect your mental state? How does not having that antibiotic affect your mental state, right? Because if you have enough, you know, uh, excuse me, you know, a bladder infection, it definitely can affect your mental state until you get that antibiotic. So there's all kinds of things that happen there with that psychopharmacology that just is amusing to me and just kind of need to learn. Then we talked about dose and dosage before, right? Dose is how much the patient should take at one time. Dosage is the total amount of drug that is administered over their condition, right? Now, a lot of times the dosage is figured on a monthly basis especially if you've got a maintenance drug, right? So what is an idea of a maintenance drug? What, when I say maintenance drug, what does maintenance drug mean? Blood pressure would be an, uh, well, that was a loud streak. That was good. Um, blood pressure would be an excellent example of a maintenance drug, right? You're taking it to maintain a healthy life, or at least pretend like you're maintaining a healthy life, right? Blood pressure, blood sugar medications would be maintenance drugs, you know, whereas something like a antibiotic, the treatment is only, you know, for that time period that you have that disease, right, that they're going to give you that medication. They don't want to keep you on antibiotics forever because otherwise superbugs develop, right? So dose, that treatment, right? So if you have, say you have a headache, right? a dose would be for you to take two Tylenol, right? And call the doc in the morning. Dosage would literally be how much you've taken over that entire headache to get better. Now, hopefully that's just those two Tylenol, but maybe that headache's a migraine and it takes a little bit longer to resolve. The dosage would be that total amount of medication you took to get out of that migraine. Uh, misfeasance, malfeasance, and nonfeasance. We talked briefly about these. Um, this was covered heavily in our discussion that we had. Know these three terms. If I'm looking at this PowerPoint, these are three that I definitely want to make sure I understand fully. So if you don't understand them, please, let's, I'm going to go over them. If you don't, still don't understand them, please speak up, right? So misfeasance is the administration of the wrong drug or wrong dose to the patient, and the patient suffers harm or even death. So I'm gonna use Jenna's blood pressure medication here, for example, right? So Jenna's in the hospital and she's supposed to be getting her blood pressure medication. Suddenly the nurse just says, you know what, I don't think she needs that blood pressure medication anymore. Instead, I'm gonna give her a sugar pill. And then Jenna suffers a, sorry, it could be a stroke, right? But then Jenna suffers a negative outcome because of not getting her blood pressure medication. That nurse would be guilty of that base, if nothing else, would be basely affected by misfeasance. All of these malfeasance, misfeasance, and nonfeasance 
can go to your license and you can lose your license. So that's why they're kind of tough. They want to make sure that you understand these. There's been a lot of this in the news lately, right? So misfeasance, the wrong drug or the wrong dose. Or maybe let's say she, again, we're going to use Jenna. I'm sorry, Jenna, you just happen to be the one that said something. Um, she's got a drug, a blood pressure medication. She's supposed to get two of her blood pressure pills, but the nurse drops one of the blood pressure pills. Really, that nurse should then get a new blood pressure pill so that she has two of them. But now the nurse is just too lazy, and half the patients in the hospital will never check their meds anyway. They just pop whatever the nurse gives them. She'd be given the wrong dose to Jenna at that point. That would still be guilty of misfeasance. Malfeasance is the administration of the correct drug, so they're getting the right drug, to the patient, and the patient dies usually via the wrong route. So, how could I give you the wrong drug or the right drug, but you still die? Okay, oral versus IV. There we go. There's an excellent example of it, right? So, instead of giving you the, or the IV route, which is the fastest way to kind of administer it, I give you an oral one. Maybe your IV is infiltrated and I just don't feel like putting a new IV in. So, I give you oral. If I suffer harm, or typically the, the real problem with this one is when patients die. That's when you usually hear about malfeasance cases is when patients die. Um, and again, most of these patients, again, most of these cases, most of these cases, most of these cases are going to be nurses and doctors. So the good news is not very common that PTs and PTAs will get hit with malfeasance or misfeasance cases. But you may be called in as material witness, right? Nurse especially, right? But you may be called in as material witness. If you've treated a patient, an example of malfeasance or misfeasance, like, oh, that falls, that's what I'm getting at, yeah. So for you guys, let's say that you're treating a patient and the patient is supposed to get a pain medication. And, you know, let's look at misfeasance first of all. So the patient's supposed to get, you know, 50 milligrams of morphine IV. And the nurse comes in and the patient's in a ton of pain. So rather than giving 50, the nurse gives 100 milligrams of morphine to the patient. And now you get the patient up. And because the patient has so much pain medication on board with them, they're all over the place and they end up going down on you. They fall, right? At that point, the nurse has given the wrong dose to the patient, right? This, this is saying that the doctor hasn't approved that dose. He's given the wrong dose to the patient. The patient has suffered harm because they've fallen. You are not responsible for that, but you are a witness to the misfeasance. Does that make sense? So that would be kind of how you could get wrapped up in that one. Um, malfeasance. Malfeasance, I've actually had a PT that was called in about this case um, because patient was supposed to be getting patch fentanyl. Um, and the nurse is like, I don't have time to go down to pharmacy to get patch fentanyl. Um, I'm just going to give them fentanyl via IV. It would still be a sentinel event. Yep, that, the fall could still be on you, Elijah. The fall could still be on you. You'd probably get off a little bit easier because of the medication problem. Um, because what the Sentinel Committee would probably say to you is, when you got the patient up to the edge of the bed, why did you keep going? And you're like, well, I want the patient to get up and walk. Okay, well, is there a way that you could have prevented this? Yeah, we probably could have. We probably shouldn't have gotten them up, right? What was me? Thank you for giving my Sentinel meeting. Go away. Um, it's, it's not a matter of when you, or if you guys are going to have a Sentinel meeting. You'll eventually, if you work in the hospital, you will have. It just is going to happen to you. Um, they're scary. They're terrifying. But for the most part, they're just there to assign blame and say, you know, what could you have done differently? And they have to file a report. They're horrible. They're annoying. But they're typically not career ending. Um, they're career ending if your patient, you know, something stupid happens to your patient. Like you're walking them around the therapy gym and they fall in the therapy pool and drown. Well, yeah, that could be career ending for you. Um, back to the malfeasance case. So patient's supposed to have patch fentanyl. And fentanyl is a really, really strong opioid. 
So instead of giving the patient patch fentanyl, the nurse says, well, I don't have time to go. I'll just give IV fentanyl. Does anyone see a problem with that? Right off the bat. So instead of getting a patch fentanyl, which is going to be transdermal, I'm just going to put some in the patient's IV. Like Alex, because I know you were in the hospital. Yeah, it's not localized, right. So I'm gonna give that fentanyl and all of a sudden it's going straight to the brain. Right, so I mean, that's the way fentanyl works anyway, it is a CNS depressant, but man, that's hitting that blood brain barrier quick. Now that, that nurse has given the correct drug, but via wrong route, therefore they have committed malfeasance. And again, if you hear that, what probably should be your response to that? You hear the nurse say that. I'm gonna give it IV instead of patch. As a PTA, what would be a good response? Check the chart, good. I would suddenly get a call on my phone if I was a PTA. I'd be like, oh, I'm gonna pay, oh, the PT wants to see me down in the office. I'll be right back because I'm going to go down and check with my PT before I do anything else. Right. Is, are you sure? Yeah, I, would only, I wouldn't even approach that, Alex, um, because I, I've approached nurses before about talking about, well, hey, you know, by the chart it says they're supposed to be, and man, those nurses will come down hard on you like, do you know how hard it is to be a nurse? Do you know what I have to deal with on a daily basis? And then you're there for 20 minutes. Um, what I would say is I check the chart and then consult with your PT immediately. Or consult, if there's a nearby doc, consult with the doc. Um, because that could be liable to him too if she does that. So there's, malfeasance is probably the worst. And then nonfeasance to me is the meanest, right? Nonfeasance is where you withheld drugs that could lead to a patient's harm or death. And this is actually becoming more and more common. Something like 30% of hospital lawsuits now are nonfeasance cases. Think about that for a second. I, I, it's like 25 to 30%, I forget what they said. I was reading it last night um, and that was you know, at three o'clock in the morning. But think about that for a second. About 30% of hospital medication cases are nonfeasance cases. That means that patient did said or just existed enough that it made their nurse so mad they didn't give them their medication. Is that kind of scary? I mean, it's kind of scary to me. And I kind of think back to me because I know what I'm like on morphine. I'm not a nice person on morphine at all. Um, I know you guys probably are really surprised that I could not be a nice person, um, but I am really not a nice person on morphine. Um, I think finally my inner redneck comes out and I channel some of my old family. Um, but I could legitimately see a nurse getting so frustrated with me that she withholds my medication. So it's just kind of terrifying to me to think that that could happen. Well, you know, withholding pain medication, is that going to suck? Absolutely. What about withholding like blood pressure med, like I talked about earlier, right? So now you go to see a patient as PTA and you see that a patient was supposed to have gotten their medications and they don't have their medications. All right, you looked at the chart. Chart doesn't show anything about them receiving medications anytime in the recent history. What do you do? Do you automatically assume non-feasance? Yeah, I check, yeah, I check with the patient first. Hey, how's it going? Make sure the, pa the nurse didn't get, a maybe the nurse didn't get a chance to document it. Hey, John, I'm just checking. Did you get your blood pressure meds yet? Oh no, nurse said she's gonna get them. Okay, cool. Let me check on it for a second for you, right? And then just talk to the nurse. Don't automatically assume a nonfeasance case, right? Because, you know, I was reading something about um, in New York, for example, with this the COVID case, 
they opened up the per patient to 46 to one in New York. Think about that for a second. They opened it up 46 patients to one nurse. Yeah, exactly. There's a, if there's a reason for that picture, that's it there. Now, why did they do that? Well, because they had nurses falling over like flies, right? They didn't have enough staff. They eventually did, right? Now, I, I doubt that they actually, I'm hoping no hospital did 46 to one. But at that caseload, the nurses overloaded, right? Even, I mean, Alex, what is in your hospital, what's your nurse's standard load on a floor, a regular floor, like a gen med floor? Do you know? Five to eight, yeah, it's about right. I was gonna say under 10 is usually what it is. But just think about that for a second. Let's just say you have a full eight, right? So you've got eight patients that you have to monitor medications for who are all getting medications at different times. We're all getting different medications who may not even be in the same general vicinity that you're in. They may be across the hall, down the hall a little bit. Is it possible they just forgot to give the medication? Absolutely. We're all human, right? So you just go to the nurse, hey, you know, hey, Nancy, I just noticed I'm going to go into 202 and I was checking. I didn't see he got his blood pressure medication. And usually at that point, the nurse is going to expel a couple expletives. And not at you, but just in general. Um, and they say that, you know, they say that, you know, doctors have some foul mouths. I don't know, I'd say some of the nurses challenge that to me. Um, and they'll say, oh my God, I'm sorry, you know, I'll get it on board. Okay, hey, no problem. I just wanted to check with you. And then you go, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll check back in a little bit because you got to give that medication time to check in, right? You can't just let, just give it to them and hope the patient's going to be up. Right? So you've helped that patient out. You've actually helped the nurse avoid a nonfeasance case. So don't automatically assume nonfeasance. But if, you know, if it walks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it's got webbed feet and feathers, it might be a nonfeasance case. Right? You start seeing a pattern where the nurse is not providing drugs to the patient. Right? And I have seen this particularly with pain meds. And usually, why do you think I've seen it with pain meds, where the patients aren't getting their pain meds given to them? What do you think is probably happening to the pain meds? Sad to think this, but so you notice a repeated, repetitive pattern of patients not getting their pain meds, or their pain meds are always coming late. Yeah, they're getting pocketed. Yep. Um, and it got so bad in the one hospital that I worked at um, in the kind of the inner city in Harrisburg that when the nurses left for the night, they got their, their, their belongings checked. They got their scrubs tops checked. They got their purses checked. You know, and was that saying that every single nurse was stealing drugs? No, it didn't. What did it say? Probably one or two were being idiots. And again, it's just like, that's why we have FSV limits, because we have one or two idiots that'll screw it up for everybody, right? It is kind of messed up. It only takes one person to screw it up. You're exactly right. Um, it only takes one person in a therapy clinic to screw up a reputation of a therapy clinic, too. We're even not even talking about this crap. So, you know, nonfeasance, again, lack of administration, malfeasance, right drug, but wrong group possibly, or for some reason the patient still dies from that drug. And then misfeasance is the wrong drug or the wrong dose. I just wanted to hit those pretty hard. Does everyone understand those fairly well? Tony takes one bat for COVID. That's right. I'm Batman. He's the one that ate it. Anyone else with questions on those? Are we okay? I'm going to say we're, assume we're okay because no one said anything. All right. Terminology pharmaceuticals. The chemical name is probably the one that you guys will never care about, right? Chemical name to me is kind of interesting because the chemical name tells me what's in it, right? Chemical name also is gonna include that fancy little drawing of the molecule itself. And I always like looking at those because I love looking at the difference between stuff like, you know, Humera and, um, I forgot what some of the other ones are like Humera. Um, but like looking at them, because when you see them, it's usually like one carbon chain that's different. Yeah. 
it's really it's really crazy when they're like you know Humira is now off label and you can get it generic and then they come out with the next drug that's supposed to be better than that and you look at the, mole the molecular layout and you're like wow look at that they added a covalent bond over there and it's the same freaking drug they just added a covalent bond and now it's a new drug um, so in this case, we're looking at Tylenol here, right? So the chemical name, right? N-acetylparamacetaminophal. The generic name, paracetamol. You usually don't see that. Where do you see it's stuck, it called paracetamol at? Does anyone know? Because you don't see that here in the United States. Yeah, in UK, yep. Or anywhere in Europe, honestly. It's usually paracetamol. Um, we call it acetaminophen, right? Canada, I don't know. Does Canada call it that way? I actually don't know. I'd have to look. I think Canada calls acetaminophen as well, but I could be wrong. And they may just call it, you know, mousse syrup, but no, I'm just joking. Um, acetaminophen, or the other term here in the United States is APAP. APAP is when you got, you're putting it onto the, um, like, other drugs, when it's coming along with Vicodin and stuff like that. Brand name's Tylenol, right? So, who can release a drug under a generic name? So who could release bottles of acetaminophen? Who could make it? Could we make it? Yeah, any drugstore, right? Yeah, any, any compounding pharmacy, any, you know, anyone that's got a license to create drugs by the FDA, right? Where are most of our drugs made? Does anyone know? China for some of them, yep. And where else? One other major country. Come on, I'm really surprised you guys don't know this. The Philippines. Philippines make a lot of our drugs. Yep, Philippines make a lot of our drugs. Um, now China's been taken over a lot and Mexico has been starting to come up a little bit on their farm, their farm stuff. And mainly because ironically enough, the, uh, the people that were supplying the cartels and that realized that there's money in the cartels, but they've, if they've got the degrees, they can make medication and sell it legally and make just about as much money. It's kind of scary, right? So anyone that has legal ability, there, legal ability to make drugs for the FDA here in the United States can make acetaminophen. Who can make Tylenol? Who is allowed to make Tylenol? Tylenol, good. <laughs> Who, who owns Tylenol? Johnson & Johnson, good, right? Johnson & Johnson owns Tylenol. So the only company that can make Tylenol is Johnson & Johnson because they own that brand, right? But is Tylenol pretty much ubiquitous with this though? I mean, when you, you don't say you're gonna take acetaminophen, even if you have the generic, you're gonna take a Tylenol, right? They've made a household name out of it. Uh, the drug class here in this case is what it does. This was an analgesic non-NSAID. And then we have to know, is it a prescribed or is it over the counter? Can Tylenol be a prescription? Yeah, absolutely. I don't know why you'd want to buy the prescription. It's kind of like the uh, ibuprofen 800 prescriptions they sell to you. Right, depending on the dose. That's exactly right, Melissa. Right, ibuprofen is a great example of it. I don't know if any of you have ever gotten the magical 800 milligram ibuprofen that the docs try to give you when you've got you know, inflammation or whatever. And you go to fill at the pharmacy and that 800 milligram ibuprofen is like 46 bucks for the prescription. And then at some point you realize, hey, why don't I just take four Advil and only pay <laughs> exactly. I had an extra bottle. Take four Advil and I get the same effect. Now, some of the prescription stuff does have a little bit better coating on it, so it doesn't upset your stomach as much. 
Right, exactly. It's just, don't even tell me that. That's, yeah, that's how your stomach was killed. And then compounding, right? Compounding is a really kind of a lost art nowadays. Um, do we still have compounding pharmacies here in town? Do you know? Does everyone know what a compounding pharmacy is? Yes, yeah, some in the hospitals. Yep, good. Um, there's one actually right down, they're usually privately owned. There's one actually right down the road from the school, believe it or not. Yeah, so they, they don't get, they don't get, um, say, Vicodin. What they get is they get APAP and hydrocodone, and they mix them together to make their own custom Vicodin kind of prescription based upon the patient's needs. And they can add stuff to those drugs that help the patient take the drugs better, right? Very typically with drugs like that, they may add some sort of an antacid so that when you take the drug, it doesn't upset your stomach as much. So compounding pharmacies are a kind of a dying art. Um, we don't do that as much anymore. I remember that, again, when I was growing up, almost every doctor, their wife in the, in the hospital or in the doctor's office was some form of a compound pharma, or pharmacologist. And I remember the, the one that we had, she constantly was mixing acetamet or acetaminophen with um, penicillin. So we get these special little drugs, special little pills that we could take home with us. And they were a combination of Tylenol and, you know, antibiotic, which then it, one broke your fever and the other helped with the infection. And then we created superbugs. Um, but usually the compounding pharmacies are patients with special needs, specifically where they've got something with their stomachs or stuff like that. So administration methods, we talked about all these, oral, rectal, vaginal, injection, topical, inhalation, and respiratory. What is the fastest route of absorption? Or the fastest route for the drugs to hit you? Injection, IV, yep. Specifically IV, intravenous, right? So they go straight back to the heart. What do you think the next one would be? Yeah, rectal, it's actually rectal tied with respiratory, believe it or not, because even breathing it in can actually have a similar effect, right? Think about it, right? When you've got somebody that's doing crack, a lot of them don't inject it. What do they do? They smoke it. It has a quick hit, right? Even, uh, what do you call it? Even heroin they're smoking, right? So a lot of times they'll switch to smoking when they've lost all their veins, uh, topical is probably the least, it's kind of the slowest one, but it also allows it to last a little bit longer as well. And people drinking rectally, yeah. Um, I, I don't know if I told you about it, when I was at Comic-Con, there was a, uh, a coffee shop across from the hotel I was staying in, I was going to take a picture, but I, could, I just couldn't even bring myself to, that was literally rectally administered caffeine. It was something about like, but chug coffee or something weird like that. I was like, are you kidding me? Uh, what are we coming to? All right, so pharmacokinetics. We get off that topic. Pharmacokinetics is kind of how we transform that drug, right? We talked about the medicinal half-life. And this, again, is another one you do have to know for your boards. What is a half-life? Half-life is the time it takes for a drug's concentration or amount of drug in the plasma to be reduced by 50%. So it's a time from when you pop that pill, or even with alcohol, right? Say you go out and you have a good night drinking. The half-life of your alcohol is when that, the amount of alcohol in your blood is at 50% of what it was at your peak. For some of you, that might not be till morning, right? Or the next day, or maybe the day after. Right? So after one half-life, the amount of drug in the system is 50%. After two half-lifes, we're down to 25%. It's not until we get down to four half-lifes where the drug is considered to be pharmacologically negligible. This applies for alcohol, too. Right? They're, they have a blood alcohol level, right? How do they have test your blood alcohol level? There's two different ways they can do it. They can give you a PBT, which is a portable breathalyzer test, or they can draw blood. 
Or usually what happens, they'll give you both if you fail the, the portable breath test. So your only hope is if you fail the breath test, that by the time you get to the hospital or, you know, even some of the police audit departments have a, uh, yeah, that you sober up so that your blood test, because the only one that is technically legally bound for court case is that blood test, right? The breathalyzer test is admissible, but there are reasonable amounts of error in that, right? Um, I was reading, they did a, a study on this that because cops are right now using hand sanitizer so much, there are people that have no alcohol in their system and are blowing positive on the portable breath test because it's reading the alcohol off the officer's hands. Yeah, that's, that's I, 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 have, I have an imagination that I would probably be quite livid if I knew I didn't drink anything and all of a sudden my PBT showed that I was, you know, 0.08. And then, of course, I'd be arrested for resisting arrest. Justin, take this down. Um, sorbitol. What's sorbitol? Anyone know what sorbitol is? Yeah, sugar alcohol. Right? Where do you, what gum has a lot of sorbitol in it? Anyone know? No, Bubblicious actually doesn't. That just has a lot of sugar, period. Mixed drinks do, yep. Okay, mixed drinks actually do have it, believe it or not. You're right, Justin. Um, Trident. And Orbit has some of it, not as much, but Trident's the big culprit. Right? Why, do, why does Trident have so much sorbitol in it? Well, Trident's supposed to be the healthy gum, isn't it? It's the one that you can chew and it cleans your teeth. Well, the way it cleans your teeth is with sorbitol. It uses a little bit of alcohol to kind of sanitize your teeth a little bit. The downside to it is uh, some protein. I wouldn't doubt that, actually. I never looked into that, but you're probably right. Especially like the fruity ones, I'm thinking, maybe. Or the birthday cake ones. I don't know. Um, I'm just speaking now. But think about that for a second, though. Right? You chew, you're, you, you're chewing some, and the, the, the officer should ask you, when was the last time you chewed some gum? So this is, this is not supposed to be on the recording here, but what happens if when the officer walks up to you in the car and you're chewing gum? Yeah, I'm thinking, I can hear Thane chewing it as we're sitting here. The sugar-free protein bar. I thanks for knowing. I didn't know that, Chris. Thanks. Um, right? So... If you're chewing gum, the officer actually technically shouldn't give you a breathalyzer test for 30 minutes. It'll be inaccurate. You're exactly right. So they're supposed to wait 30 minutes after you spit the gum out before they can take your breathalyzer test. Ask them to go. Take me drunk, officer. I'm home. Um, here, officer, hold my beer while I find my license, right? But the, the thing is truth, right? So they should, and this is, I. I Unfortunately, from having family that are police officers, they're supposed to wait. You can actually blow a false positive from gum. So not saying that that can be a way to help sustain yourself from getting arrested, but I'm just saying maybe keep some gum handy. Uh, excretion, how do we get rid of it? Kidneys and liver, obviously are the ways that it gets filtered. It's tequila flavored gum. Uh, feces, we do pass some of it out through our fecal matter. Uh, Respiratory, we do breathe some of it out. Thought was some error. And then some of the some of the drugs we don't actually excrete; we store, right? Adipose, muscle, and bone store some of those drugs. Uh, the peak medicinal level and the trough medicinal level. Do I have to cover this, or do you understand these? Are you good on peak and trough levels? Does anyone not remember this? Okay. You don't remember it? Okay. Right. It's highest and lowest. Good. Right. Peak is when the drug is at its highest effect. Trough is when it's at its lowest effect, right? When you're at the trough level, it's typically going to be when you need your next dose, right? And it, even if you think about somebody as an addict, right? Their peak level is when they're high. Their trough level is when they're starting to crave that drug again. 
uh, that kind of helps you understand peak and trough levels, even though that using that is not the best example, it does kind of help you grasp the concept of it, right? So like with pain meds and PT, you want to see somebody typically at their peak of their pain meds because you want to have the maximum pain relief. But if you go at the trough point, you're going to have a bad session because they're going to be hurting the whole time. So you've got to time those sessions just right. Uh, side effects. All drugs have side effects. Doesn't matter what the drug is, right? And these are physiological effects not related to the desired drug effects. Now, sometimes we will find a side effect and realize, hey, we could actually use that side effect to our advantage, right? Antihistamines, right? What's the most common antihistamine you can take? Benadryl, Benadryl and wine, Ian's got that down, right? Benadryl is really good for antihistamine. But we also realize somewhere along the lines, one of the side effects of Benadryl is it makes you sleepy. Or makes some, most people, not me, and wires me out and gives me restless leg. And that, there's that 1% that it does that to. So we saw that Benadryl had this side effect of making people sleepy. And so then we said, hey, can we market Benadryl as something else and make more money off of it? And sure enough, stuff like Easy Z's and all those sleep medications, if you read the, those, a lot of those sleep medications, they're nothing more than Benadryl, right? Because the side effect is that. Now, when you're taking it for sleep, the side effect would be relieving any histamine effect, any itching effect, right? So you're looking at the way you're taking it. Adverse re reactions are the most severe type of side effects, right? These are usually unwanted and they could, would be not normal at normal or recommended doses, right? They usually are almost always undesirable, right? We don't want somebody to have a heart attack from taking Tylenol. That would be an adverse reaction. And Tylenol can cause heart attacks. Tylenol can cause liver failure. That would be an adverse reaction to Tylenol. Effects must always be reported and documented because they represent a variance from the planned therapy. So if you're taking a drug and all of a sudden you're getting these adverse reactions that you don't normally get, tramadol is an excellent example. Does anyone know what tramadol is? I think I've talked about it before. Has anyone ever taken tramadol? It helps you sleep. It could, yep. That would be a side effect of it. Um, tramadol is a pain med. It's a really, 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 really weak opioid. Right? That's its main job. It's a really, really weak opioid. But as you take more and more of it, it kicks your inflammation system into overdrive a little bit. And it'll kick your histamine up. And so guess what starts happening after a while of taking tramadol? If your histamine's kicked up, what do you start doing? Itching. Yep, exactly. That would be an adverse reaction of tramadol. And you would want to report that to your doctor that, hey, you know what? Every time I take tramadol now, I'm, I'm breaking out. I'm getting rashes. That would be an adverse reaction to taking the drug. That can also happen with any opioid, actually. But tramadol just seems to be the one that I've seen caused most commonly. Um, the other drugs, they probably don't cause it as much because they knock you out. Adverse reactions should be reported to the FDA by the manufacturer. So the manufacturer should always be reporting these adverse reactions because sometimes the FDA is going to have to do what to the drug? Modify it, right? Or pull it entirely, right? Celebrex and some of those. Uh, Vioxx, I think, was the big one, right? Vioxx, we found out, had some really bad effects in the heart and they had to pull it off market. So all of that's a, that would be an adverse reaction. People dying is an adverse reaction. Dependence and addiction, right? We talked a little bit about this, and again, another one you do have to understand. Tolerance. You guys have all built up a tolerance to being stuck at home. Or maybe you haven't, I'm not sure. If you have a cat, that cat has not built up a tolerance to you being at home. Maybe your dog has, your dog's quite happy for your plants, but you, you have tolerance, right? 
Tolerance is typically the first step in either dependence or addiction. Now, just because you build up a tolerance to a drug doesn't mean, oh my God, I'm becoming an addict. I've heard that happen before. Oh my God, I've got to take more of my pain meds. Am I becoming an addict? Well, no, not necessarily. Are you craving the drug? Well, no, well, probably not, right? But it can start to lead to that dependence and addiction, right? The body's slow response to adapting to it, you need greater and greater amounts to achieve similar results. A great example of that is caffeine. I'm pretty sure that most of you in this class, if I give one cup of coffee to you, that caffeine does almost nothing to you anymore. Right? And a lot of it has to do with all these chemical drinks on the market nowadays, right? The Red Bulls, the Bang Energy drinks, all that type of stuff. You know, they have, that has weakened our, to that has increased our tolerance to caffeine. I openly admit I have a wicked intolerance to caffeine. I can just, you know, pound caffeine back all night and still fall asleep most times. Um, and I actually have cut back on caffeine quite a bit. But, you know, how do you overcome tolerance? Yeah, stop it. Yeah. Right? You wean yourself off and maybe take yourself away from it for a little while and then come back. And then sometimes you come back and you'll get the opposite effect. You get a wicked problem from it, a wicked side effect from it. So you have tolerance, and then you have this weird term called tachyphylaxis. Personally, I just like the word, but it literally means a rapid tolerance developed to a drug. Usually this will happen with pain meds. And a lot of times if we see somebody's got tachyphylaxis, we start thinking that they might actually be abusing drugs to start with. Um, so, you know, the first day we give them, you know, 10 milligrams of, uh, hydrocodone. Let's use that as an example. And it relieves their pain. The next day we give them 10 milligrams or in four hours, we give them 10 milligrams of that same medication. It's not doing anything. They've had a rapid tolerance developed to that drug. And at that point, we've got to look at a different therapeutic. Uh, dependence. This is when the patient requires the drug to either physically or mentally function. And the reason I added mentally to this because it used to be dependence was only a physical effect, right? That you need a drug to function, right? A lot of times I think, coming from my family again, I think about the alcoholics in my family, right? I have family members that are completely and utterly functional drunks. If any other normal person would drink the amount that they drink, their heart would stop. But that's a normal, you know, by 11 o'clock for them. And if they don't drink that, they can't function, right? So like Jenna right now, Jenna, if we stop your blood pressure medication, that would be bad, right? you have a certain dependence right now to that blood pressure medication to keep you healthy, right? But let's take that a step further because I know some of you, I'm not going to say who you guys are because I actually don't know. I know some of you, it does, it absolutely does depend upon type, right? I know some of you are taking either anti-anxiety meds or antidepressants. You've become dependent on those as well. And if you just stop those cold turkey, bad things are going to happen. So there is a mental component to dependence. Addiction now, not only does the patient require the drug to function, but now there's physiological and psychological craving for the drug. Some of you have an addiction to caffeine. I've seen it. I give you a break in class and smoke is rolling off your heels for you to get out to that table to take a shot of your bang. I would border to say I have a mild addiction to coffee and Coke and I'm talking cola, right? I have a mild addiction to that. I will admit that I probably do. I have a really strong dependence on it, but I do have some physiological cravings for it. Um, I noticed the one time I forget where I was. Uh, this was before I was here. I was doing a, a six week stunt stint in Northern Iowa. 
and uh, you know, this big snowstorm came in. And they're talking about, you know, it's gonna be you're gonna be snowed in the house for five to ten days or something like that. And I was in a hotel. And it was funny because everyone's buying, you know, bread and milk. I was worried that I was gonna run out of Coke Zero. I literally was worried about that. And at that point I went, okay, maybe I need to wean myself off some of this stuff. I'm just saying. Right? I had a physiological craving for the actual caffeine that's in there or whatever it's in. That's kind of scary, right? There have been a lot of studies lately that have shown that there might be an addictive quality to fast food. Would you believe that? What do you think? Yeah, I say McDonald's french fries to some of you. <laughs> Ian's like, yep, he's already out the door and going to get some. Let's call him DoorDash, right? Or Chicky Nuggies, right? It's and Food in general can actually be an addiction. You're exactly right. Um, so all that can be, you know, the craving happens. I, um, Michael Moore did a, have you ever guys ever seen the Super Size Me movie yet? If you haven't, I highly recommend it. It will terrify you from fast food, I think. What was the premises of that movie? Do you remember? For those that didn't see that movie, it was the premises. Yeah, he eats McDonald's every meal for a month. What did they? What did he find out at the end of that month? Well, first of all, they found out he was unhealthy, right? He felt like crap. It's really bad for your body. And he also found out he was craving it. Yeah, I'm sure he probably ate the grilled chicken sandwich with lettuce and tomatoes. I don't even know. But anyway, sure, we'll, we'll say that he did. Well, yeah, again, but it also shows that everyone's different too, right? But, you know, McDonald's is okay in pieces. I'm not saying McDonald's is all bad. So the key thing here is, not all dependents are addicts, but all addicts are dependents, right? And this is big in the psychological world. Just because somebody's dependent on drug, we don't want to label them as an addict because an addict has a stigma to it, right? I mean, as soon as you're labeled an addict, you start taking on the addict's mindset, right? And it's really hard to not be an addict. If you're dependent, you can usually kick it. Placebo versus nocebo effect. Typically discussed in research, that can be done with any number of treatments and not limited to just pharmaceuticals. What's the difference between a placebo and a nocebo effect? Do you remember? I put some questions in here so we could wake you guys up. A placebo is what? So a placebo, I'm telling you you're going to get what? I'm going to give you this drug and you're going to get better, right? And are you getting the drug? No, you're in a sugar pill, right? Nocebo is the exact opposite. And it can also be no control too. But nocebo is typically discussed with, instead of saying, I promise you, Mike, if I give you this drug, you're going to get better. And you take the sugar pill and you get better anyway. Nocebo tells me, we've had patients with negative side effects, like they've lost their hair. Um, They've had really bad itching. Uh, they've developed genital warts. And we don't give you the drug and we give you the sugar pill and you develop all those symptoms anyway. Right? So there's a placebo and nocebo effect, right? Do you feel either of those is worse psychologically for the patient? What do you think? Do you think the nocebo, yeah, the nocebo effect I think would be worse off, right? Yeah. I almost don't think that's an ethical thing to do to a patient. So you're telling them, by taking this drug, you're going to get worse. I, I, there are people out there, Russell, they'll be amazed at what people will test for drugs. I'm telling you. Um, what about physiologically? Think about that, though. If you're going to the placebo effect, man, like, 
I think physiologically, that one's worse. Psychologically, the nocebo is definitely worse. But physiologically, you, you, you know, they just sold you basically snake oil and you believed it. So it's kind of scary both ways, I think. All right, let's talk about some pharmacology. We've got a couple slides here yet. We're not, actually, I almost threw this whole thing. So I broke them up into each kind of grouping. So on them, I put the score builders page number on this so that if you want to go back and review each of these, you can. We're going to talk through some of them a little bit here. So we have neuromuscular pharmacology, so neuromeds. Main ones you're going to look at, right, are anti-epileptics, antispastics, dopamine acetylcholine replacement agents, and then muscle relaxing agents, right? So which of those two do you think get commonly misconstrued to each other? Or they kind of get confusing? Because two of them often get lumped together. the antispastics and the muscle relaxants. A lot of times people don't understand. Yeah, exactly, good job, Mike. A lot of people don't understand the way they work differently, right? So anti-epileptics, do I have to explain to you what anti-epileptics do? What do they stop you from doing? Having a seizure, good. Side effects of those, almost, uh, actually, I can just pretty much speak through all of these. Side effects, almost all of these drugs are drowsiness. Even the dopamine and acetylcholine replacements have a certain amount of drowsiness to go along with it. Um, so they all have that kind of that drowsiness that goes along with it. Antispasticity meds promote relaxation at the muscle fiber level. Understand spasticity and stuff like that is all a CNS effect, but spast antispastic meds work more at the muscular level, whereas muscle relaxing agents work more at the CNS level. Okay, so that's the major difference between them. So antispastics work more at the muscular level, whereas muscle relaxants work more at the CNS level. Which of those then is going to be more sedative the muscle relaxants or the antispastics? Yeah, the muscle relaxants are gonna have a lot more of a sedative effect. You're exactly right. Um, so baclofen is an example of an antispastic. That's probably the one you're gonna see the most. Dantrium's out there as well. Um, but baclofen is the big one you see. There you go. That was gonna be one of the questions at the end of the lecture here actually, Russell. What happens if you take both at the same time? Well, so what's gonna happen is at the sarcomere level, the muscles are gonna relax. And then the CNS part that's causing that spasticity is gonna relax. So you actually get a better relaxation out of it. And you can actually hit, inhibit that spasticity a lot better. A lot of patients will be on a long-term antispastic med with a short-term muscle relaxant. The downside is both of them are gonna cause you drowsiness. So you take them together and man, patient's zoned out. He's gone or she's gone. They're passed out sleeping. Um, I've seen patients like this, even little kids that are having antispastic and muscle relaxing meds from uh, CP, they're sitting out in the lobby and they're just zombies. They're just so dead to the world because they can't keep themselves awake. It's pretty bad. So dopamine and acetylcholine replacement agents, those are going to be ones for patients that have, you know, MS, MG, all that type stuff. Muscle relaxing, we talked about a little bit. Uh, the main muscle relaxants you're going to see a lot of times are flexural, scalaxin, and soma. Valium's out there, but it's also an anti-anxiety med. Uh, Valium is specific for muscle relaxing and non-specific for anti-anxiety. But soma, soma is the big one you'll see. Man, don't ever try to take an old person's soma from them. They will fight you on that. Those are fighting words, right? So with neuromuscular pharmacology, what kind of stuff are you going to have to watch for? What's safety-wise you're going to have to watch out for? What do you think? Falls, yeah. Balance and falls are all going to be screwed up, right? And that also means we need to work on energy conservation again, right? Because we need to get them to conserve energy so they don't fall as much and they have more energy. 
Because if you're to take these meds and they're wiping you out, you need to use as little energy as possible to get stuff done. Musculoskeletal farm, right? Again, this is page 122. There's a couple of different ones of these, right? Disease modifying anti rheumatic agents. What kind of patients are you going to see that are on disease modifying anti rheumatic agents, do you think? RA, good. What other ones? Lupus, yeah, there we go. House's favorite, right? Um, sarcoidosis again, a couple of the other ones like that. Um, mixed connective tissue disease, uh, Crohn's, all of those type autoimmune disorders, you're going to see them. Uh, Rheumatrex and Areva are kind of the most common ones you'll see for that. With an anti rheumatic agent, what they are trying to do, um, they just had one, I can't think what the new one that just came out is. Um, but the anti rheumatic is trying to slow down the breakdown at the muscular level from the rheumatic, rheumatic disorder. Because slowly but surely, if you have a rheumatoid condition or an autoimmune condition like that, your sarcomeres are breaking down, right? A lot of them will eventually get ulnar drift of their hand and get claw hand. So, and yeah, you know, if you've ever saw somebody's got pure rheumatoid arthritis in their hands, their hands look gnarly. They've got nodules all throughout the joints. So these disease modifying agents, their job is to stop that breakdown. Glucocorticoid agents, Demacort and Corderol. Why would you take a glucocorticoid? What are they going to help you with? Could be allergies. Okay, good. Right? I was just looking. I've got one sitting on my desk here right now because uh, I've got a, a nasal spray that's a glucocorticoid. Right? Flonase. There you go. Good. Right? Glucocorticoid. Just to let you know, you can become addicted to them. And then your sinuses won't work anymore. And so you have to use them constantly to function. I think I've actually become that way. Um, what else could you take glu glucocorticoid for? Cort glucocorticoid. Do you remember any medical conditions where they take them? Do you remember AdSense at all? little bit, the big, big moon face thing that you get from taking corticosteroids, right, from having too much blue or too little glucocorticoids. Uh, then the non-opioids and the opioids fall in this category as well, right? So non-opioids are just pure analgesics or like Tylenol. You have your NSAIDs, which are Aleve and Advil, and then you have your opioids, right? And there's just whatever you want. There's a whole rat, you can name about 50,000 different opioids out there, right? Opioids, where do they all stem from? What plant? Unless it's a uh, chemically altered. Opium, yeah, comes from poppy seeds. You're exactly right. So I always love when people are like, man, I had a bunch of poppy seed bagels. I'm worried I'm going to pop positive for my drug test. No. The poppy seed bagel is not going to make you pop positive. Yeah, I had a Big Mac, exactly. It's not going to make you pop positive, right? I think it's the four drugs you did on Saturday night, Bubba, that's going to make you pop positive, not the poppy seeds from your bagel. Um, so all of these have very similar side effects. What are some of the side effects of musculoskeletal agents? Well, your belly gets upset. Almost all of these are stomach irritants. Right? So what should they do in order to help relieve some of that stomach irritation? How can I stop from eating food? Yeah, eat before they take it, right? Or drink a glass of milk works for some people or buttermilk. Uh, that's a big home remedy from where I'm from. I could never stomach drinking buttermilk, but you know, my family swears by it. I don't think I could ever drink buttermilk. That just sounds gross and it makes me kind of nauseated just thinking about it. So that means we got to watch out for that. They're, a lot of times, if they keep taking these long term, they're going to develop stomach ulcers, right? So they have to be aware of that type of stuff. You get down to those opioids, now we're back into that kind of lethargy and sedative effect. So we've got to watch that as well. But even the non-opioid in the end said, some people have a sedative effect to them. Some people, they take two Advil and they pass out. So we have to be monitoring. Again, safety is the issue here. With the, 
excuse me, with the disease modifying agents, we have to be careful because those patients are going to be more likely to bruise and get infected as well. So we've got to provide them with proper, you know, re, you know, proper care, maybe proper PPE, stay away from them if we're sick. Same thing with glucocorticoid agents. But the main one for the muscle ones is upset stomach. Cardiovascular, I think I have two slides on cardiovascular, I do. So cardiovascular, there's a whole mess of cardiovascular drugs. Whole mess, right? So we start with the triple A's, the alpha and genetic agonist or antagonist agents like Cardura and Minipress. We have the angiotenesis converting enzyme inhibitors or the ACE eyes. We have our anticoagulants, we have our antihyperlipidemics. We have our anthrothrombolytics or thrombotics and our beta androgenic or beta blockers. So when I look at these, I divide my heart meds up into a couple categories. I divide them up into ones that affect my blood and ones that affect my blood pressure, right? On the list that we have on the screen here right now, which ones affect my blood pressure? Does anyone know? So I have blood pressure, not blood itself. Anticoagulants really don't affect your blood pressure too much, believe it or not. Your triple A's, yeah, the triple A's, right? The betas and the ACE inhibitors. Those are all gonna affect your blood pressure, right? All of those are gonna help regulate your blood pressure. They're either gonna work on the smooth muscle of the heart. Okay, good, yeah, right, some people are. And it, I assume you found out about it in the worst possible way too. Yeah, exactly, right? So that's usually what happens. And with heart patients, it is really hard to figure out what medication they need to take. Jenna found out the heart way. And it's never gonna get old, right? So we have to rotate them through a, stop. We have to rotate them through a bunch of these meds. Are you ever going to be the best at treating patients with heart meds? Probably never going to know them all. You're not. I mean, if you do, you're better than me. I constantly have to carry my little pocket uh, pharmacology and thing to look up the meds the patients are on because I forget what they are. But if I know that they're on an ACE inhibitor, I know their blood pressure is going to be affected. If their blood pressure is going to be affected, their heart rate is going to be affected. If their heart rate is going to affect them, their blood pressure is going to be affected. I know I've got to worry about getting them up and down because they're going to have orthostatic hypertension, right? I know I may have to go slower because they're not going to move as quick. Yep, you're exactly right. Thank you, Jen. I was actually going to cover that. The, uh, actually, all of them do AAs too. Um, all of them make you a little bit more susceptible to having negative effects from COVID. Um, and I will say my little tuning, my little horn here. Yeah. Um, I was kind of right about the whole surfactant thing. They just released a study that showed that COVID is affecting the surfactant of the lungs, but I don't know anything, so I'm just a PTA. I'm just a PTA. So our, a our ACEs, our double triple A's, and our betas, and then also going down into the next page here, our calcium channel blocker. Right? And even a little bit of the nitrates, we'll cover them separately. So calcium channel blockers, beta blockers, our anti-angiotensin enzyme inhibitor ACEs, right? our AAAs, all of those are affecting the heart. They're going to affect your blood pressure. They're going to affect your heart rate. They're going to affect your cardiac output. That means you have to be careful with those patients. Those patients should always have a gate belt. They are hard to stop cold turkey. You're exactly correct. Because think about it, your heart's adjusted to them. You stop cold turkey and your heart has a flip back effect. So it can really be problematic if you try to stop them cold turkey. So if you are working with a patient that's on these heart meds, those specific heart meds, what are you probably going to want to check frequently on your patient? Vitals, good. That's the major thing that's going to be on your test about these. You need to know all of those, the triple A's, the ACEs, the betas, and then the calcium channel blockers are going to affect your blood pressure. The nitrates are also going to, but in a different way. 
So now let's talk about the anticoagulants, the antithrombotics, and the thrombolytics. Those are all going to affect your clotting factors, right? They're going to affect clotting factors in different ways. Anticoagulants are going to keep the blood from clotting, right? So they're going to keep the blood from clotting together. These are kind of the old drugs, right? Heparin and Coumadin. Does anyone, do you remember what I told you these came from? Does anyone, did I talk about that, where they found this from? Rat poison, exactly. Yep, that's what you, when you give a rat rat poison, you basically cause them to bleed out. Poor rat. So, the difference between an anticoagulant and an antithrombitic agent, anticoagulant is going to affect three or four of your clotting factors. Thrombitics or thrombotics are going to affect almost all of them. And what they are going to do is keep you from developing a thrombus. And if you have a small thrombus, it's going to keep that thrombus from affecting you. It will not break up the thrombus, but it'll keep it from affecting you overall. So usually patients are going to come in, they're going to go on an anticoagulant, and then long term they're going to go on an antithrombitic because they're going to go on that to keep them from developing blood clots. If they get really, really bad with blood clots, they're going to go on a thrombolytic medication. A thrombolytic is also known as what type of a medication? Does anyone know? The stroke medication, good, right? These are also our clot busters, right? So whereas the other two don't break up blood clots, the thrombolytics will break up a blood clot. So if your patient has a blood clot, they're going to be on thrombolytics. Doesn't matter which one of those they're on. What kind of side effects are they going to have? All three of them have pretty similar side effects. What are you going to look at? What are you going to have? Bleeding, bruising. Yeah, all of that stuff is going to be bad, right? Wound care is going to be a mess, right? Wound care is going to, if you are cleaning a wound, they're going to bleed all the time while you're doing the wound care, right? So that means we need to be careful transferring them in bed. If we start seeing a pressure injury, we need to prevent and protect that pressure injury. Anything that we can do to keep them from developing pressure injuries, bruises, cuts, anything like that, that's going to be the important part with these patients, right? All of them, if you get a bleed, you're going to bleed heavily, right? Now, let me throw a curveball in here. What about a mother that might have to take these? Why might a mother have to take these? Just a newborn mother, or not newborn mother, but mother who just gave birth. Does anyone know that was mothers? Could be a tear. Okay, good. Could be. We're going to talk about that when we get into the women's health lecture, the episiotomies. What about RH factor incompatibility? Have you guys ever heard of that? What is that for those mothers? Because I'm sure they discussed that with you a little bit. What does RH factor incompatibility mean? Yeah, basically baby's blood and your blood, they don't like each other. Yeah, they don't, they, they just, they're, they're, they're at odds with each other. And a lot of times when that happens, mama develops blood clots. RH positive, and what's the other one? I wonder. RH negative, good, yeah. Right? So a lot of times when that happens, when you have that effect, mom's going to develop blood clots. And so she's going to go on a short-term period of being on one of these, you know, the anticoagulants, the antithrombolytics, or the antithrombolytics, depending upon what, how bad the clots are. That can be problematic. Because let's say that mom has to go on the antithrombics back here, thrombotics, for a long period of time. They usually get a shot. Yep, exactly. Um, but say that you, you have to have this post-birth for a long period of time. 
eventually mom is going back to a regular menstrual cycle. Now you're on a menstrual cycle taking a medication that doesn't allow your blood to clot. Yep, that's pretty much uh, that's the best way I can put it. Um, so that can be a problem as well, right? So all of that kind of has, to, we have to kind of pay attention. If a patient's starting to bleed, they can bleed out quickly. So we have to pay attention to that, right? Patient gets a bleed, what should we do? Scream for help, right? I'm not talking about that type of bleed. I'm talking a cut bleed. Patient gets a, you have an old little lady who's on one of these meds and she gets a cut on her leg. What should we do? Pressure, yep, get pressure and then get help. Get the, get the proper dressings for it, right? Anti-hyperlipidemic agents. Oh my God, that's a nice way of saying what? Anti-hyperlipidemic. Yeah, it's a nice way of saying cholesterol med, right? So cholesterol meds are gonna affect your overall body cholesterol, both lows and highs, right? So that means that the patient's gonna to have to be on a special type of what? On top of taking the med. Diet, good, right? Now some of those diets, they may not get the proper amount of iron, they may not get the proper amount of protein. So in cases that our patients are on stuff like that, we need to make sure we're talking to them about staying on their diet. They may not have any side effects. I mean, sometimes those drugs will give you a little bit of sleepiness and stuff like that when you take them, but very rare. So like Z Zocor and Lipitor, they really don't affect you too much. Um, but we need to be paying attention to those patients' diets, making sure they're eating the right type of stuff. Uh, diuretics, these are probably the patient's least favorite things because diuretic is going to make you do a specific letter of the alphabet and it's going to make you pee. Right? So a lot of patients don't want to take these, but patients that have heart failure need to take their diuretic because that fluid is going to build up and it's literally going to cause them to drown in their own fluids. So they need to be taking their diuretics. Um, nitrate agents, right? Nitrate agents, what do we use those for? What do we use nitrate agents for? Does anyone know? Right, rapid vasodilation, good. Um, a lot of times the nitrate agents may be prescribed long term, right? You may have to take them long term, but most of the time you're going to get it when you come in and you're, they think you're having a heart attack, right? They're going to, where are they going to put that nitrate agent? Under your tongue. Yep, it's going to melt. It's going to taste horrible. And I, I just want to tell you guys this, unless you're on Viagra, right? Because that actually is a nitrate agent. Um, I'm going to tell you, if any of you ever have to experience this medication, it sucks. I have no other really nice way of saying it. Um, this medication will cause the worst migraine you could ever possibly imagine. You will literally feel like the right side of your head is going to explode. And you kind of pray for it because it's that bad. And they can't really give you anything for it. A lot of times they'll give you a half a cup of coffee to help it because the coffee will help constrict those blood vessels in your brain. But for the most part, what happened is your blood's, your brain's getting way too much blood, right? Which is exactly what happens with Viagra, right? The reason why Viagra works and causes erections is because it opens the blood vessels of the penis, which allows more blood flow in, sometimes to the point of priapism, which no one ever wants to talk about. Um, positive ion ionotropic agents. These are specific to the heart. Again, the positive ion I know ionotropic agents are really designed to help with blood pressure, but they are specific to the heart itself, right? What they do is they help the heart contract stronger. Whereas the others are kind of lowering the blood pressure, this one is going to allow the heart to have a more forceful contraction. So do you think when you take that, you're probably also gonna have to be on a blood pressure med? What do you think? So you're on a medication that's causing your heart to pump a lot harder. Do you think they're gonna put you on a blood pressure med too? 
Yeah, they're going to have to. So otherwise you could burst a blood vessel somewhere, right? So the, the, like Lamison's job is to help the heart pump better, it's to help that cardiac output. And then they're going to yeah, right, give you the blood pressure med to decrease peripheral resistance. So again, safety is the big one here. Almost all of these, the main thing you're going to want to do is monitor the blood pressure, monitor the pulse. You're going to be paying attention to the signs and symptoms from your patient, right? None of these are going to cause your patient's blood pressure to spike unless they're not taking it. So that means if your patient starts showing symptoms while you're treating them, what should you have them do? So you're walking them down the hall and all of a sudden they're starting to show symptoms and side effects from their blood pressure meds. What should you have them do? Does anyone know? They're walking down the hall with stop exercise and sit down. Exactly, right? This is the opposite of hyperreflexia, right? Hyperreflexia, your blood pressure is shooting through the sky. With these meds, their blood pressure is bottoming out. So we need to sit them down to in order to kind of bolster their blood pressure. That's the main thing with these. You're going to get a lot of questions on these that you're going to have that are going to be safety-wise. They'll ask you what type of vitals would you measure. But more importantly, they're going to say that the patient is having a hypotensive crisis while you're walking the patient, what should be the first thing you do? The first thing you should do is sit the patient down. Don't continue to have them stand because if you continue to have them stand, they're going to fall. Endocrine pharmacology. Uh, the good news for these are, for this, you just have to know that it exists. Yay. Say yay. No one's saying yay. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Chris. Right. So the main thing here is you have to know that these, these drugs are there to replace things that would be normally present in the endocrine system. Right. Um, the, they can be hormone replacement agents. So if maybe a woman's having problems with estrogen, they can be an estrogen replacement. It can be a guy that's having problems with testosterone, right? The testosterone replacement. The main thing we need to know about is if they're on it, what, what does that hormone do, right? What if you have thyroid replacement medications, right? Well, your thyroids are probably too low. That means we're gonna have to be talking to them about diet because they're probably gonna end up being overweight in the long run, sweat, and their blood pressure is gonna be affected. Safety again, right? Um, the bone mineral regulation agents, those, I don't, has anyone ever had a family member or anything that's taken either Boniva or any of those, Fosamax? No? Okay. A lot of times when you have a patient's on these, you got to make sure that you don't schedule physical therapy on the day they're getting their injection. And the reason why is because a lot of times when they get their Boniva or their Fosamax injection, the next day they hurt really bad. And what it is, is the body is absorbing all the calcium into the bones. So that means if your calcium is low, that means those calcium channels are shut down. That means you're going to start cramping up, right? So we're going to pay attention to those patients. And then if we have somebody that's got a hyper, hyper function or hyper functioning endocrine system, we're gonna to try to slow it down. They have a hyper hyperactive thyroid. We need to slow it down and make it less active, right? So the main thing there is you need to know just kind of your general endocrine system. You know your endocrine system, you can answer those. GI pharmacology, almost all of us have taken one of these at some point in our lives, right? Antacids, right? How many of you ever had Tums? I'm gonna to say probably all of you at some point, or milk and mag. Right? They help keep your stomach acid down. Antibiotics, right? You wouldn't think about this, but an antibiotic is actually a gastrointestinal medication, right? Same thing with the fancy probiotics. It's a gastrointestinal med. Intestinal anticholinergenics, right? This is to this is different than an anticholinergenic for patients that has M, like myasthenia gravis. This particular medication is just so that it reduces the effect of ACH on the gut, not on the rest of the body. 
right? So if you think about it, if you have too much ACH in the body, right? Think Parkinson's, they get that really rapid shake in the tremor. Same thing can happen if you have too much ACH in your stomach. You can actually get a quiver going on in your, your um, colons and stuff like that, and that can cause problems. Antidiarrheal agent, right? This isn't really funny, right? Diarrhea is kind of hot and sunny. Diarrhea, no kidding. Um, Antidiarrheal agents obviously stop you from having diarrhea. What's one of the side effects of having diarrhea? The major side effect, other than embarrassment. Dehydration, right? And eventually maybe constipation, exactly, right? Because you can get so dehydrated, now you go the other way. So they've got to rehydrate. Anti-emetic agents, what does that mean? Anti-emetic. So we're gonna talk emetic and anti-emetic. What's anti-emetic mean? Because I'm sure some of you pregnant women here have had an anti-emetic at some point. Yeah, it's to stop nausea and vomiting. Yep. So anti-emetics stop you from throwing up. Well, then that makes you think, what is an emetic agent gonna make you do? An emetic agent is going to make you do the technicolor yawn, right? You're going to purge your stomach. Um, for those of you that have never had the glory of smelling Ipecac, has anyone ever smelled Ipecac before or taken Ipecac? Just curious. Does anyone know what Ipecac tastes like? It is gross. Does anyone know what it tastes like? really, really, really super sweet maple syrup. Most of the people that have ever had to take Ipecac will say they will never ever eat pancakes again. Because as soon as you smell syrup, you think of Ipecac. Um, what kind of patient might we give an emetic agent to? Why might we force them to throw up? Poisoning, good, right? Even drugs, poisoning, right? Any of that. Uh, charcoal is another one, right? They'll usually give Ipecac with charcoal. So the charcoal's job is to go down and neutralize as much of the drug as possible. The Ipecac is to make them vomit it up. H2 receptor blockers and the proton pump inhibitors. Those are all to control long-term acid reflux. Some of you may be on these. If you're not, some of you may eventually be once you have kids. Um, Tagamet, Pepsid, Prevacid, Nexium, all of those job is to prevent your stomach from having too much acid, right? And actually your whole gastrointestinal tract. If you take too many NSAIDs, you might have to eventually take one of these, right? And then the laxative agents, that's to stop, go from the other side of diarrhea, right? That's to help you go. And can, Considered with those laxatives also are the stool softeners, right? A laxative is gonna make you do what? Yeah. Laxative is going to make you poop. Bye-bye, see ya. It's going to force your body to poop, whether, yeah, it's gonna make you go number two, whether that is a hard poop or a soft poop, you're going to poop. Hopefully, on top of taking a laxative, you have taken a stool softener because the stool softener will make that poop go much easier, right? So be aware of that. That's very common with babies that parents will give them a laxative to help them go poop, but then forget that poor little baby is pooping now, now concrete blocks. And they wonder why baby's crying while he's pooping. Well, you know, they just laid a whole building in their, their uh, diaper, so be a little friendly to them. All of those, really, the nice thing about these is you just have to know they're on them, and most of the times we're just gonna be talking diet to these patients. Psychopharmacology, if you see someone that's got psychological pharmacology, it means they've got some sort of a psychological issue. So good news, all of these medications, Again, very similar to our neuromuscular medications. What do you think the number one side effect of almost every single one of these medications is? Yep, drowsiness, sort of like this lecture. So we have our anti-anxieties, right? 
Some of you need that right now. The antidepressants, other of you need that, right? And antidepressants are named by what they treat. You have your antipsychotics. I think sometimes I need that, right? Antipsychotics, the job of the antipsychotic is to bring you back to reality, right? Back to life, back to reality. That's kind of their goal, back to life and then back to reality. Uh, bipolar modification agents, lithium integridol. Thank you, I appreciate it, Alex. Their job is to regulate your mood so you have a more even mood. Sedative and hypnotics, right? These will take a patient and basically knock them cold. Uh, Halcyon and Haldol are the big ones here. But if you look, Haldol is both an antipsychotic and a sedative hypnotic. They cross over quite a bit. And then the bottom one, who are you going to see a lot of the bottom one? Who's going to, who are you going to see that have probably taken these meds at the bottom? Kids? Yep. And one other student's okay. Yep. So I'm just, I classify kids, Justin. I classify kids in that same thing. Um, but also professional office workers of late. People that have high stress jobs. It's amazing how many of them are on Adderall or Ritalin or Concentra. It's really amazing. Wall Street especially, yeah, right? Um, and when they have these, what's the, first of all, what's the difference between ADD and ADHD? Does anyone know what the difference between ADD and ADHD is? One has hyperactivity, right? ADD is the person that gets distracted by the squirrel. ADHD is the person who gets distracted by the squirrel and then follows it. That's the way a lot I've heard it described a couple times, right? Hyperactivity disorder kind of makes it worse. Um, the key thing here is, and this is kind of counterintuitive, all the meds to treat ADD and ADHD are really nothing more than legalized meth. They really are. They're methamphetamine salts. And for some reason, when the body is hyperactive to begin with, if you give them a hyperactivity medication, it stops the hyperactivity. But the downside is it exhausts you. And when you're coming down off your ADD meds, it's exhausting. And that's probably why I haven't been sleeping well, because I'm going to take my ADD meds for a while because I've been at home. Don't need them when I'm at home. I can follow all the squirrels I want when I'm at home. Uh, nutrient supplement pharmacology. So we have our fat-soluble, water-soluble vitamins that are our macronutrients. Then we have our minimal, mineral supplements. And the mineral supplements are usually broken down into the macro minerals and the micro minerals. When you see the macros, those are the ones we need the most of. The micros are the ones we need the least of, right? So all of these can be gotten through eating normal food. But if you don't eat normal food, you may need to take supplements to help you with these. Um, your water soluble, anything that is water soluble, be careful because you can't really overdose on it because you're going to do what to it? Cobalt can poison the blood. Yep, absolutely. That's why it's a micronutrient. You wouldn't want a macro in that one, baby. That could poison you, right? Same thing with fluorine, right? You don't want a lot of fluorine in your body. I heard somebody tell me that some guy on some radio show say that's what turns a frog's gay. Um, I don't quite believe that guy, but I heard it. And obviously, if it's on the internet, it's got to be true. Um, but water-soluble stuff, you'll just pee out. Anything else, especially when you get down here to those micro, mic macro, and micro minerals, they will get stored and they can poison you. Right? Even lead, you need a small amount of lead in your body, but you don't need to be chip chewing paint chips. So if you see somebody that's on these, it either means A, they just are taking it because it's funsies and they want to throw away money and they're not eating, or B, they don't eat right and they're using these to supplement it. Oh my God, what the heck, so sure much, right? First, take your anti-anxiety meds and or antipsychotics if you need it right now. So you need to know the safety of the medication, how the medication at peak efficacy may interact with one another, right? So you need to know if you've got a patient that's on pain meds, 
and is taking a blood pressure med, what are they going to look like? Well, they're going to be drowsy, right? They're going to be drowsy because the meds make them drowsy. They're also drowsy because their blood pressure is low. So you have to monitor them. With the heart meds, almost all of them interact with the smooth muscle or the cardiac muscles to reduce the overall workload of the heart. So we've already talked about this. What do you need to monitor? The vitals. What would be some symptoms to watch out for that would tell you their vitals are going out of whack? What could be sweating, dizziness, lethargy, any of that, right? And again, with the heart meds, the number one thing we've got to do is do what? The opposite of hyper, rea hyper reactivity disorder, right? Or, or yes, yeah, sit down. With mental medication, almost every single one of them has lethargy as a side effect at the peak and the trough levels, right? So this is interesting though, when they're on those, the mental medications, there's not really an ideal time to see them because some of the medications will cause you sleepiness at the peak. Some of them will cause you sleepiness at the trough period. Kind of in the middle area is the best time to see them unless they're psychotic and then you do want to see them at peak period. But even at that point, they're kind of lethargic. They're just not there. So how many meds is too many meds? That's a great question, right? Um, if you ask some doctors, anything more than one med is too many meds. Anything when you get into that polar farming is too many meds, right? But, you know, today's average patient is on like 2.7 meds, 2.8 meds. And that means some of you in here are on no meds, right? But then that means that somebody else in the place is on six. So that kind of works out in the long run, right? How do you deal with a polypharmic patient? Well, what do you do if you have a patient, you're gonna go see, you know, at an outpatient clinic tomorrow, and you look at the chart and they're on like 15 different medications. What should you do? You see a patient's on 15 different meds because you're doing chart review, yeah. Ask about the compliance check-in, right? When they come in, talk to them about making sure they're taking their meds. Make sure they've got a healthy diet, right? Well, what about before you see them? Talk to the PT, right? Yeah, talk to the PT and consult your little pocket desk reference, right? Go to find out what those meds do. Sometimes it's gonna terrify you because you'll be like, what does lithium do? Oh, look, it's to stop people from eating faces. Yeah, ask the nurse, anything like that. Talk to the doc. Right? Find out what these meds do so they can help you understand, right? Patients on ketamine. Oh boy. Right? Ketamine's a super tranquilizer, right? I've had patients on ketamine. When they're on ketamine, that means the other sedatives aren't working, right? Ketamine has a fancy term out in the uh, the rave world. It's called vitamin K. And it's a horse tranquilizer. I had patients on it. Well, guess what they're going to be like? They're going to be a wreck, All right? So what can you do to minimize your patient and your safety risks? Well, you can have them understand what they're on, right? Give time to figure it out. Now, in today's you know, world where we're seeing too many patients, it's not always, the, I, we don't always have time. But a good clinician will always take the time to learn about their patient. The other thing is, always be gate building. Always make sure they got a gate belt on. I don't care. If they're on more than one med, they're getting a gate belt for me. If they're on one med, they're getting a gate belt for me. And I have nothing else tell them it's for my own safety. That way they can catch me if I fall. Um, but make sure they're on a gate belt, please, right? Always assume that a patient is on some form of mind altering medication because almost all of these have some form of mental alteration that they give you. Even the blood pressure meds are gonna affect your overall mental state. Could even be alcohol, right? I've had patients come in that they're absolutely obliterated. You know, and you have to treat them differently. And then also don't assume that pediatric patients aren't on medications. I'm starting to see pediatric patients on heart meds. That's terrifying to me. Right? I've got pediatric patients that are on blood pressure meds. I don't know what that's going to mean long term for them. 
right? So just make sure that you're looking kind of everything. Um, so let's just talk real quick. What kind of medication do you think you'd face with a patient that's older than 65? What do you think? What kind of stuff could you think that they might be on? Beefy meds, almost definitely. Lipids, right? Gabapentin, right? Gabapentin maybe for neuropathy, good, especially if they've got diabetes, right? Any diabetic meds they could be on, right? I didn't put those. Those are kind of in the, uh, the abdominal, the stomach modifying ones, right? Okay, so what about a single mother or a single father at like around 35? What kind of stuff could they be on? Xanax, good, right? Could be Adderall, anxiety meds. Yeah, Xanax is a really common one. Could be on allergy meds, good, right? Could be something simple like that that's causing them problems. Then you may talk to you and say, man, I just, I just cannot stay awake. And you're like, well, what kind of meds are you taking? Why well, take like five Benadryl a day? Well, no wonder you can't stay awake. You're basically giving yourself a sedative every 15 minutes. Good job, buddy, right? Uh, what about a child under 16? What do we usually suspect with those kids? If we got medications, what do you think some of the stuff we might expect there? Yeah, ADHD or ADD meds, good. Undisclosed drug to alcohol, good. Autism meds, there's another one, acne meds. Acne meds I really didn't talk about, but there's another big one that can cause lethargy. Uh, anxiety, especially nowadays, right? Because kids are getting picked on and they don't have the tough skin that we used to have, right? They don't just brush it off. Um, does anyone know what marijuana does to a child under 16? It's perfectly okay for them, right? It chills anyone out, Justin. Yes, that's exactly right, Alex. It actually slows down the brain development. And the other thing it does is it, is from the point that they start taking it, it stops neuroplasticity. That means the brain will not develop as normal as they would, right? It can actually eventually lead to, yeah, it can actually eventually lead to problems down the line as an adult. Right, and it's, I, I won't ask where that came from, Russell, um, but it definitely could, right? It could lead to problems down the line. What about a recovering alcoholic? What kind of drugs might they be on? Well, if number one thing I'd be worried about is what? Yeah, gastro liver meds, good. I'd be worried about alcohol. I know they say they're recovering, but NyQuil's the 13th step. Right, you'll be amazed at how many people are recovering alcoholics that drink NyQuil like it's going out of style. I'm not drinking alcohol, I'm drinking NyQuil. Right, or Tussin, anything like that. Or Listerine, exactly, right, good. A recovering drug addict. What kind of, st they might have medications that are there to stop them from reusing, right? There are actual medications that if they take drugs will make them sick, right? What's the big drug that they give patients that are coming off of meth and coming off of heroin? Suboxone or what's the other one? Methadone, good, right? Basically the same thing, just again, chemical change. That's all it really is. Guess what the number one side effect of those are? The same effects that have with meth and with uh, heroin, it makes them lethargy. It slows their brain down. They can't function at a high level, right? So we gotta be watching that. What about athletes? What are we thinking sometimes with athletes? Right, could be, yep. What about anti-anxiety meds? Okay, could be, right? Or let me add a thing. What about a uh, wrestler? May not be roids, what else could they be taking? Yeah, weight loss drugs, diuretics, and emetics. It's amazing how many wrestling coaches get a hold of Ipecac and make them take two or three spoonfuls of it. So they vomit up their stuff. 
right? So all that could be a problem. So what should you do as a PTA or what should you avoid? Avoid talking about specific meds. Remember, we don't, we don't have degrees in pharmacology, right? This really includes recommending vitamins and supplements. Our job is not to recommend what they to take. Refer them to the pharmacy, exactly, good, right? So this doubles if you are a, and I'm gonna put this in quotes, sales representative for something like Herbal Life, or the, I forget what some of the other ones that are out there, the, uh, the nutrient drink ones. Um, I don't know, I, I, there, there's all kinds of them out there. You know, the MLMs that aren't MLMs. Um, if you are one of these individuals that are part of these companies, you may want to inform your employer. And a lot of employers require you to inform them that you are a salesperson for Herbalife or a salesperson for, I'm drawing a blank on what the, the big shake one is that's out right now. I can't think of it off the top of my head. Um, and here's the deal is if you are one of these salespeople, one of the places they're going to ask you to sell these macronutrients and whatever else they say is talk to your coworkers, bring them to the meetings, do that. If you want to get fired, right? If you think that your career is more in herbal life than it is a PTA, go right ahead and do that. But you got to understand your job is not there to sell your coworkers or your patients medications. Your job is to make them better. Uh, don't suggest that they talk to the doctor regarding, you know, Valtrex today. No, that's what commercials are for. We're not supposed to be referring them to drugs, right? But at the same time, don't be anti-medication, right? There's a healthy skepticism with medication, but also some people need these medications to function and or live. It's not your job to tell them they shouldn't be taking the meds. You know, there are times where I've looked at patients in medication lists and I'm like, oh God, man, they don't, they really don't need all these meds. It's not my job to say something about it. At that point, I talk to the PT and I, if PT wants to talk to them, they can, but it's not my job to counsel them on you're taking too many meds, right? Be logical. I know it's difficult, but try it. It's really fun to be logical with these patients, right? Don't try to push, you don't push your biases on your patients either right? Maybe you don't like opioids. I really don't care for opioids. I have to be careful and not try, I have to consciously not say to patients, you know, you really don't need those because honestly, this is the way they're working and blah, 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 blah. And they're not even making your problem better anyway. And you probably end up with as a heroin addict down the road. I can't say that, right? I have to be as objective as possible. And this is really difficult, especially for new clinicians, because you guys are going to come out and you're gonna be gung-ho and ready to go and oh my God, I'm ready to fix the world and you're not jaded yet. It'll come after a while. Um, but you have to understand that it's not our job to do that. Our job is not there to do that. Our job is to help them physically. If we think they have a problem with medications, we need to talk to the PT. Don't confront your patient and be like, yo, bro, yo bro I know you're on steroids, right? Probably not going to be the best option. You're probably not going to have a good face day, right? So think about that kind of thing before you present it. I really want to stress that if you guys are, and I don't know if any of you are, I'm not saying that you are, but if any of you are sales reps for any of these companies, I might get a little angry, exactly. Any of you are sales reps for these companies, you have to tone it down in healthcare. I'm just telling you outright because it is a quick way to get yourself blacklisted across the community and not find jobs, right? It's really easy. And I'm sure some of you have had family members that are like, hey, can you come? To, I've got this business opportunity I'd like you to come to on Tuesday night. Any of you ever get those talks from family members or friends? I've got this great, this great company I want you to come take a look at. Even strangers, yeah and unfollow. <laughs> yeah, Justin, well, you're a prime market for it. Sorry to say, but you are. You're impressionable and you're young. Right? And not only that, but because you're impressionable and young, you have a large market. Right? And they're not, they don't care about, I hate to say it, but MLMs and stuff like that don't really care about you. 
yeah, I can stress that with you there too, Justin. I'm just going to say. Um, they're not there for you. They're there for all the people you know. They just are. So don't allow those things to cause you to lose your job. I'm not saying that Herbalife is bad. I'm saying their business model is bad, but I'm not saying Herbalife's bad, right? It's, it's just another pharmaceutical company. It's no different than taking something like uh, Nature Made or whatever that you might buy at them. What do you call it? At the uh, pharmacy, right? But you have to temper that when you're working at a clinic. You have to make sure you don't get yourself in trouble with that type of stuff. Any questions I can answer? Other than, oh my God, that took forever. I must stop recording.